Well, hi there, folks. My name is Dara Star Tucker, and this is The Breakdown. Thank you so much for joining us here on KJLH Radio, where we sit down every week and we take time to talk about the issues that matter. You can find me on the KJLH Instagram page at Radio Free KJLH. On Instagram, on my personal Instagram page, I'm at Dara Tucker B. Everywhere else, you can find me online at Dara Star Tucker. That's Dara with one R and Star with two. Well, we are trudging into the last two or three weeks before the election. I don't know about you guys, but I am, I, I don't want to say I'm tired. But I'm feeling the strain being a content creator that is out here in the trenches doing the work really every day. You guys are seeing content for me and many other people that you love and you follow like the guest that I'm about to introduce you to this week. I really want to these last two or three weeks, I want to introduce you to some more folks that I really admire and respect who are in that political space, who are speaking out, who are helping to keep people informed. And my next guest is one of those people. He is someone that I have followed for a long time online. His username or his handle is Too Raw Too Real. That's with the number two, Too Raw Too Real. His real name is Kenny Walden. And I want you to say hi to the folks, Kenny. We're going to do a brief introduction, and then we are going to get into a discussion about something that is becoming quite the hot topic here in the very last weeks of the political season. So, Kenny Walden, thank you so much for joining me today on The Breakdown. Thank you, Dara, for having me. Hey, it's your boy, Tarot Terrell. You guys know me from either TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, either cussing folks out or getting people straight, but debunking this information. <laughs> Or going ham for Vice President Kamala Harris because that's my political auntie. Y'all know I do not play when it comes to her, okay? You may know his content because he goes viral fairly consistently. Kenny, when I watch your videos, I'm just like, oh, sometimes I'll, I'll gasp listening to certain things that you say. Like you say, cussing folks out. Kenny does not care. And his name, his moniker it speaks to exactly his style. So I'm just warning you, if you follow his page, which I am highly recommending that you do, Too Raw, Too Real, and that's with the number, well, it's the number two, raw, and then T-O-O, -O, real, Too Raw, Too Real. If you follow his page, be prepared. It's NSFW, not safe for work. Like, don't have it up at full volume if you're at work. Because there's going to be some choice words for you. Around your children or around church, okay? <laughs> And that's one thing that I love about you is because your style is so different from mine and we need different approaches and different styles when it comes to communicating with different audiences. And that's one of the things that I love about you and so many other people that I have connected with in the online space in the last few years is that we all approach what we do very differently. But when that intelligence is there, which is, it is there with you and with your content. And when that information, you bring the facts. I'm like, you can get mad at his style, his delivery with some people. That's exactly what's going to reach them. You can get upset with the delivery or say that's not appropriate or whatever. No one can argue yeah. with the facts that you bring. And you were going hard for Miss Kamala Harris long before Anybody knew that she was going to be the nominee. And while many people were showing her a lot of disrespect. And so my hat is off to you for that. What is it that first drew you into Kamala Harris? Because you have been her ride or die, her number one advocate online since I can remember. So what is it about Kamala Harris that first uh, drew you in and that still does? So we have to take a journey back. Okay, let's go back to the future. Okay. So come on, Marty, let's go back to the future. <laughs> let's go back to 2019 during the um, Democratic primaries. I remember I was actually a Warren stan at first. I was originally backing Elizabeth Warren when it came to the primaries. And then when Kamala Harris threw her hat into the ring, I'm like, oh, who is this lady? I've seen her in those hearings, you know, drilling Bill Barr. And I've seen her drilling Kavanaugh, but I also remember her specifically in California when she was attorney general, I remember her going against Proposition 8, which was trying to make sure that we uh, acknowledge same-sex marriage. So it was around that time that I was like, okay, so who is this lady? Let me give her a chance because I'm still open. I don't have to pledge any loyalties to anybody at this point. Mm -hmm. I just want to somebody's going to be representing me and also 
giving specific policy that will actually affect me and my community. Hmm. So I traveled to Morehouse and she was talking about, because this was her first rally in Morehouse in Atlanta. And she did a rally and it was just so many people. You had people of color, gays, you had trans, you had blacks, you had everybody there. And she was talking about her agenda and she brought up a specific policy that she wanted to be introducing while she was a senator called the LIFT Act. Now, if anybody doesn't know what the LIFT Act is, it's actually a tax credit that's actually, you can actually get it monthly where it gives you a $3,000 tax credit. And this was the first policy that actually geared towards people from low income. As long as you made less than $125,000 a year, you qualify for this policy. Now, the thing that drew to me is because I was living paycheck to Sunday, not paycheck to paycheck. And if somebody who... <laughs> of unexpected expense because the most average unexpected expense is around three to four hundred dollars and common heroes is offering up to five hundred dollars which is collectively monthly with the lift act this was the first policy that was geared to people who feel like they're being penalized for being responsible people who may not be married people who may not have children because it seems that if you don't have children if you're not married then all of a sudden you don't qualify for any type of relief and this was the first time she was actually introducing a policy that was almost geared to the poor, people who are literally mm -hmm. poor pain. And that resonated with me. So from then on, I'm like, okay, well, let's just go ahead and start supporting her. So I started donating a few things. I started canvassing for her. I started volunteering for her. I went to go work for her in Greensboro when they were looking for volunteers to host that rally that she was throwing. Then I went all the way to a campaign event in Charlotte, gave some money there. But it wasn't until she was combated with all this misinformation, there was like an onslaught of all these op-eds that were literally re-characterizing her prosecutorial record. And I'm like, okay, something just don't sit right with me. And I remember there was misinformation around Clinton's campaign when she was running in 2016. And I remember back in the day, I felt so helpless because I felt like I was screaming into a void by myself, mm -hmm. telling people think isn't completely correct when it came to Clinton and the crime bill that she couldn't vote for. But yeah, Bernie did. And they were doing this false equivalencies. And it was this blatant misogyny and sexism that played the role into that, like because she had no constitutional authority to do anything as first lady. But they kept making excuses for the white man. So I'm like, OK, what do what can I do? I started reaching out to black influencers, people who already had platforms. I'm like, OK, it seems like what they're putting out on Common Heroes is, isn't correct. I have the actual factual information about her record. And these are articles prior to her running for president. So they obviously are unbiased. And back mm -hmm. then they were her a social worker, not a prosecutor. Because when people talked about her locking up black men, it just didn't match the data. Mm -hmm. Because as the marijuana emissions decrease, according from like, if you do the comparison from Terrence Hallinan, which was her predecessor, he jailed over 135 people in seven years. Kamala Harris only sent to prison 45 for just marijuana alone. And then mm -hmm. on top of that, he created one of the first in the nation reentry programs that focused on low-level drug offenders to get them out of prison, get them access to training, uh, wellness, give them access to being able to get a GED. And after they finished the program, she expunged their records so it wouldn't be a barrier for them to get a job. So all of these Kamala Harris is locking up black men for simple marijuana was just lies. So when I reached out to these black influencers, they said, nah, I'm not going to do that. I'm not hmm. going to post this. I'm not going to do this. Even the people who quote unquote said protect black women, they refused to do it. Hmm. They said, if you want to do it, you and your 200 followers, you, you can gladly yell into the atmosphere and put out the information yourself. And rather than feeling salty and bitter, I'm like, well, you're right. This is your platform. You have every right to do what. So mm -hmm. I decided, set up my phone, get me a ring light, and then the rest is history. Wow. I just started working it myself. And it started off with just me with my little 200 followers. It started climbing to 10, to 20, to 30, to 100. And then we started collectively sharing the information, and we created this community called the K-Hive, where we made sure that we showed Kamala Harris that she has a backing that supports her and we will not allow any lie to stand on her record because we believe that she's the perfect person for that moment, which is perfect for this moment. Mm -hmm. And it's a fight for our rights because there's one thing to say that 
oh, what I want to do. It's about what you've already done, which is going to prove that you have a track record of actually getting the work done. And everything Kamala Harris said that she stood for, whether it comes to criminal justice reform, whether it comes to LGBT, when it comes to protecting women from violence, when it comes to wealth inequality, when it comes to intergenerational wealth and building Black wealth and investing in HBCUs, and investing into Black education, she has her hands and actually has provided substance to the American people when it comes to these particular issues and these policies. Mm hmm well, I mean, you say that she's here for basically such a time as this, then that means that you are as well. Because like I said, you were one of the ones who was highlighting her record, really working to dispel misinformation about her before she became the nominee. I mean, how long ago did that start? How long ago did you really start to lock into her and start to work on combating this misinformation and disinformation around her? Well, it started in 2019 and then it kind of just grew on from there. It's kind of hard pushing against misinformation because people believe the first thing that they see. Mm -hmm. And you already know first impressions mean everything. Mm -hmm. So when you come back with real facts, right. um, unfortunately, some people, rather than just saying, oops, I was wrong, let me retract mm -hmm. my statement. A lot of people have the tendency to double down. Yeah. And even when it comes to that, the only thing we can do is keep pushing back and pushing back and pushing back and trying to put out the facts. But we already understand that with, as you could probably understand yourself, as a Black woman, it's kind of hard and you're already pushing against the wind when it comes to just being able to be seen, mm -hmm. uh, number one, being able to be believed, number two, being able to be protected is number three. And we already understand that Black women are the least protected and the most vulnerable among us. Even me as a Black gay male, there's certain privileges that I'm rewarded that you unfortunately will not be able to benefit because of patriarchy, because mm -hmm. I'm a male. Mm -hmm. And I understood that it is my job as somebody particularly who is pro-Black and believes in truly protecting Black women, it is my job to stand in the way and be the fence for Kamala Harris. Mm. Well, it's a really popular thing now to do commentary on a wide variety of things, on race, on culture, on history, on politics, on all sorts of things online. I remember when I started doing my videos, it's been probably close to four years now. There were really not very many informational creators who were doing the kind of content that I was doing. I just was like, okay, I'm a nerd. I'm going to geek out about this thing that I'm interested in. But what I've noticed as a lot more people have started to throw their hat into the ring with informational content, especially right now in political season, a lot of them, there's not a lot of depth to what they're doing. It's just, you know, this is great. This is bad. You know, I, I like this. I don't. Why are you voting for this person? Oh, I didn't like. Did you see the crazy thing that Trump did yesterday? And that kind of thing is going to get a certain number of eyeballs. But what I notice about your content versus a lot of other people who are doing commentary right now is that you are so factually based. You, you provide so much depth, so much richness and so much information behind what it is that you're speaking about. And I've watched a few scraps that people have gotten into with you publicly where you've had to go back and forth with some folks who wanted to lash out and come against something that you were saying or whatever, or just criticize you for being a Democrat or talking about Democrats. And I certainly have dealt with that kind of criticism myself, but I think people come after you pretty hard about that because you are so definitive in what you say and how you say it. But then when I hear you talking about the time that you took, you were not just someone that popped up online and said, hey, people are getting a lot of views for this stuff. Let me jump in here and see if I can get on this train. You're clearly saying you were involved in political activism even before you became a content creator. You were not doing this with the purpose of being a political commentator necessarily. You were active and involved in the work on the ground in real life. You were attending rallies. You were canvassing. You were organizing. You were traveling. You were giving. You were learning, studying, understanding. And so I think the approach that you have taken is actually quite different from the path that a lot of these kind of online, chronically online political commentators, so to speak, have taken. What you're telling me is that there is a depth there that goes beyond trying to make money, trying to be an influencer, political influencer, or anything like that. 
So I, first of all, I'm just, I'm appreciating the fact because when you come back, I'm like, don't get into a scrap with Kenny about anything unless you are ready to deal with some hardcore facts because he will come at you and I'm going to play a couple of clips of your content so that people can hear kind of the nature of what you do. What I want to know is how do you retain so much information? I do some off the cuff stuff here and there, which I've done in the last couple of days, just where I'm sharing my thoughts. But I'm not really going to be sharing a whole lot of just hard data and facts when I'm just doing off the cuff. I do scripted stuff and I have very curated videos that I have to think through and study and assemble and, you know, that. But I feel like a lot of what you do and correct me if I'm wrong is very it's almost like off the dome. I mean, how do it actually you is off all the that dome. information? Like a lot of the stuff is very much off the dome. But yeah, I can tell. I like, so when I research things, right, I make sure I read it, reread it, read it again. And then I think about it and I dissect what I'm reading, especially when mm. it comes to like policy, particularly policies that are going to affect me. I'm like, OK, how can I put this in a way and relate it to everyday Americans? Right. Mm -hmm. I'll go back to the lift that I was talking about. OK, so do you know what the average payday loan is? Do I know the amount of the average payday loan? I would guess somewhere between five hundred and a thousand, but I don't know. No, the average payday loan is around three to four hundred dollars. Now, remind <laughs> you, Kamala Harris's Lift Act was a credit that you could actually collectible monthly to two to five hundred dollars, right? <laughs> and everybody knows that most Americans aren't able to handle an unexpected four hundred dollar expense. Yeah. And if you look at the statistics when it comes to payday loans, about 72 percent of payday loans, they're not spent just willy nilly. They're spent towards utilities. Towards rent. Yeah. So when you're looking at that tax credit, I'm trying to piece it together, saying, OK, if you know that you don't have no money in your savings account, and you know that you don't have the ability for an unexpected expense. You driving down the street and you all of a sudden you got a flat tire. Now you got to get a new tire and you don't have new tire money. This money is collectible up to monthly that you would actually be able to put in your pocket just for mm -hmm. this rainy day. Some people don't have no rainy day. It's mm -hmm. all that rainy. People are constantly robbing Peter to pay Paul, constantly mm -hmm. having to collect all this unnecessary interest on their credit cards because they have to keep swiping because of some unexpected expense. Right. I'm trying to connect the dots so people can see, like, this is something that you can apply to your everyday life. And even if you don't have an unexpected expense, Put it towards your savings account so that way you have that rainy day fund. You mm -hmm. never know what's around the corner. Mm -hmm. So that's how I'm able to kind of remember because I remember from my own personal experience. I've had a payday loan. Child, mm -hmm. they, they messed me up, ruined my whole credit. I'm back together now. But back in the day, Lord Jesus, the, the interest <laughs> didn't make any sense. About 400 percent interest doesn't make yeah. any sense. But. Because I guess I'm a person who's closest to the pain, I'm able to pinpoint people's pain points and be able to relate it to them. Because honestly, I'm no different from anybody else. I'm literally the average everyday American. I'll call myself regular schmegular for a reason, because I am. I just decided to put a camera up and start recording what's going on. So when people come at me, which I find it hilarious that I'll have certain political pundits or former elected officials try to come for me, and talk about how I'm getting paid. I'm like, you, you, we're, we're not the same. Mm -hmm. Like you're, you're out of touch with the people, which is probably the reason why you weren't able to win your election and got lost and lost twice. It's hard to kind of <laughs> clap back at me when I am the people who actually, we're the people who elect folks. We're the one who put people in their positions, right? And you're talking to the people with such disdain and you're speaking from a place that's so classist. It's just ridiculous. I just don't have time for it. Yeah, well, I want to kind of get into a conversation about this current election season, Kamala Harris, how you're feeling about everything. And of course, there has been a lot of focus on Black men specifically. I have my thoughts on that. I think there has been too much focus on what do we do with Black men and why are they voting for Trump in higher numbers than what they would normally vote for Republican candidates. I think there are some really basic reasons that, that Trump as a figure tends to appeal to black men more so. I think if you have a, a female candidate at the helm, you're going to have a certain amount of misogyny, to be quite honest and frank about it. You're going to have a certain amount of misogyny with all men, whatever color they are. There are certain men and there are certain women too, who will never 
vote for a woman, or at least they won't now. That's just not going to happen. And so I feel like a lot of that energy just tends to be a little bit wasted. I don't necessarily want to feed into a lot of that just poking the bear with Black men. But I think what I really want to talk to you about is Black men, yes, but more so Black voters in general and your feelings about how they are taking Kamala Harris in, what they are making of her. How do you feel the Black community, and I say Black community, this is an entire nation of millions of Black people, so we are not a monolith, obviously. But in terms of just Black people's reception in general to Kamala Harris, how are you feeling about our relationship in general, if that's even possible to assess our relationship with her as a candidate? I think a lot of people are finally being introduced to Kamala Harris because the Kamala Harris that people, and she's been seeing a lot of positive reception than negative, let's just be honest when it comes to Black support. And Kamala Harris has been doing excellent when it comes to Black support. If you compare her numbers to Biden's, literally just within three months, she's been able to double those numbers. Mm -hmm. But as far as the community, a lot of people are just starting to be introduced to Vice President Kamala Harris because the mere fact of that we have this thing called erasure, which is the main reason why I continue to talk about her accomplishments on my platform. So when people didn't know what BP was up to, I'm telling people, okay, you know, Kamala Harris traveled to Africa. She met with the Tanzanian president. She was able to secure a nickel power battery a deal with them. So where it would actually not only invest in clean and renewable energy, but it's going to bring equity not only to Tanzania, but also to us. We're going to benefit from this. Kamala Harris is doing the work. She's met with hundreds of leaders. She's been able to work out cybersecurity deals with Macron in France. She's traveled to Central and South America, reinvesting into that continent. So that way they won't have to flee. That way they don't have to come here. Because a lot of people think that she's borders are, which is not even a thing. You know, her only job was to deal with root causes of migration, not mm -hmm. to be at the border. That's Alejandro Mayorkas, that's, that's Homeland Security. We can't, those two different things. But the reason why I had to highlight these things is because the mere fact that a lot of the times when it comes to Black elected officials, we don't get our just due. We don't get the, the, the same recognition. We don't get the same level of views. We don't get the same um, highlights from media, particularly, because they're so keen focused on unfortunate white men. Donald Trump, he barely does. He does the bare minimum and will get views for it. Mm -hmm. So I, it was my job to make sure that I highlighted particular policies that, that benefited Black people, whether it had been student loan forgiveness, whether it had been $17 billion to HBCUs, whether it had been lifting up 50% of Black children out of poverty with the American Rescue Plan with the child tax credit, whether it had been passing the Inflation Reduction Act, lowering the cost of insulin, when we know that disproportionately affects Black and Brown communities, particularly Black communities, because disproportionately affects us most. But as far as the reception she's getting, I think that she's getting a lot of positive, and we have to understand that the internet is not real life. Most of the times when I talk to people, and I'm, I'm in a blue state child, I'm in Maryland. <laughs> most black people I talk to, I hear good things from Vice President Colin Harris. I hear a lot of people supporting her here. But I understand that I'm in a blue state, so it might be a little different. But when you have these conversations, particularly with people in the community, and we have the hesitations of Kamala Harris, we have to understand that as Black people, we have to stop having such a unrealistic expectation when it comes to Black officials, because we are the minority. Not only the minority in this country, but we're also the minority when it comes to Congress. There's only 62 Black elected officials. And even when you're looking at Senate, there's 100 senators and there's only four Black elected senators right now. Mm -hmm. And if you want to count Tim Scott, that's up to you, but he's technically still Black. So, hey, we only got four. <laughs> In order for us to move the needle, we need to elect more Black elected officials. If we mm -hmm. want to see more policies that's geared to helping our community, who better to do it than Black leaders, Black legislators? But we set such an unrealistic expectation because we feel that, oh, a black person made it and all of a sudden they're, they're supposed to change the entire structure of our government. How? In order for them to do it, you have to give them tools to be successful. Giving them tools to be successful is making sure that you're voting blue all the way down the ballot. So that way they're actually able to overcome these obstacles in Congress. They need 218 votes in order to pass the bill to the House. And they need to overcome that 60 vote filibuster in the Senate. In order for us to be successful, we have to make sure that we're gearing up these Black elected officials for success. We have to stop allowing 
white mediocrity to go unnoticed while also simultaneously putting our elected officials feet to the fire when we don't give them the things that they need. Well, I, I feel like you have you speak with such a knowledge of how the system works. And I feel like there's a lot of ignorance. I'll just put it plainly. There's a lot of ignorance out there with regard to how our political systems work. I really try not to do a lot of the back and forth in my comments anymore these days or in my DMs. I just had someone reach out to me recently and, you know, I don't understand how you're posting this stuff. And I'll, I'll do a lot of reposting in my DMs on Instagram around Gaza, because that's an issue that is of great concern to me while I'm still advocating for Kamala Harris and Tim Walls, because I don't feel like those two things are mutually exclusive. I feel like we can advocate for Gaza and have that concern around a whole lot of issues and still understand that we are in a far better position to fight in that regard with a Harris Walls ticket versus what we have on the other side. That's a very straightforward thing for me to understand. Now, if someone else lands somewhere else, that's on them. I'm not here to try to convince somebody that they don't need to vote in the way that they want to vote with regard to Gaza. But there seem to be a lot of people who are kind of ignorant as to how our system works and who are looking for easy answers. That's a lot of what I see going on right now, even with people that I agree with about a lot of things. But I feel like on the right and on the left, unfortunately, a lot of the the foolery, you know, the foolishness that I see pop up online where leftist people are attacking liberals and these kinds of back and forth ridiculous things are popping up because people are looking for things to be simpler and more black and white than what they actually are. They are not thinking about who funds war efforts, who funds the war machine. That's not the president. It certainly is not the vice president. It's Congress. And I hear you point these things out regularly. You and people like Elizabeth Booker Houston, who also is extremely knowledgeable about political systems and how they work. And it's like people, a lot of people don't seem to have the patience for that. They really just want a black and white, simple paint by numbers explanation. This is wrong or this is out of skew. How do we make it right? Well, we put you in and in this, it's not any better. And I just don't like it. So let me go try something else. Let me try something new. Well, maybe Trump has the answer. Well, I got a stimulus check off of him. So maybe I'll get another one. You know, this kind of thinking. And so the weirdest thinking ever. How can they sit here and say they want another stimulus check? We were in the middle of a pandemic. Are they wishing for another pandemic? Do they understand the reason why they got it was because of a pandemic? What pandemic are we in right now? I, I, it's just like, it's frustrating. But these people who want to blow up the system, in order to be able to deconstruct something, you have to first understand how it works. Yeah. When it comes to when they demolish a building and stuff like that, we'll have it come down, tumbling down perfectly. They have to understand the structure mm. of that building before mm -hmm. they can bring it all the way down. It's the fact that you don't understand it. And my whole purpose is, I want you to understand it because it, whether you want to tear it down or not, you have to understand how to navigate this structure in order to see real change. I think a lot of these people speak from a place of privilege because if they're sitting here blowing it up and want this revolution, do they not understand that most revolutions are always been to the detriment of the most vulnerable and which mm -hmm. will also be black and brown people again? A lot of these people don't care about how this could harm people and they don't have any system set in place for people who rely on government assistance, people mm -hmm. who rely on um, public housing, people who rely on SNAP benefits, people who rely on getting their social security and things like that. They, they speak from a place of privilege, which makes me believe that for somebody who says that they're quote unquote a socialist, you must have a lot of money in the bank mm -hmm. to be that privileged to say, oh, well, let's just blow up the system. Or your parents do. Right. You, parents. Got, you got exactly. parents who fell off. And you know you'll well, be okay. We already know what type of demographic right. this is. Right. So right. It, it's just kind of like you're speaking from both sides of your neck. And you think that, you know, this moral superiority is you're just doing this for points on the Internet. But what have you actually done in your real time 
to mm-hmm. ask help anyone other than yourself. Yeah. The, the mantra that I have started repeating, at least to myself, I am determined. I am not going to get in the fray. I feel like I'm crawling to the finish line with this election. It's a and I have to your it is a distraction. And I have determined that I'm not going to put my hat in the ring with any of that, the back and forth. I don't know if you witnessed earlier this year. I was pulled into kind of a weird back and forth with a leftist earlier this year that was basically accusing me of being paid by a pro-Israeli organization to put out content. I had done a video on a a theory called the Khazar theory that purports that the Jewish people that we know of as Ashkenazi Jewish people don't actually come from the Levant. In other words, they're just Western Asians, Eastern Europeans. And so it was this wackadoodle theory that this person was, who was actually Jewish, they came after me and said that I was being in the pocket of APAC. So I kind of reached my wits end with all of that earlier this year. And so I have been determined that I am not going to invest in this latest round of, frankly, white leftist nonsense on TikTok. And it seems like every few months we end up in this cycle of dealing with these types who feel that it is their job to talk down to black folks in particular. It ends up being this weird thing where they end up focusing on Black creators and trying to lecture us, first of all, about Black history. This latest dust up had to do with a, a white leftist creator who was invoking Angela Davis. I heard something about Fred Hampton. It just started to get silly after a point. And I'm like, what is the purpose? I think you were saying earlier, it's, what do these people want? What is their goal? Because if you're dealing with a conservative you know what their goals are. It's like, but a leftist who is saying we want to bring down Kamala Harris and our whole goal is just to stop this movement. It's like what? So to let to let Trump in, I don't understand the goal at all. Their if goal is to understanding that you can get the, their goal is to continue to move the goalposts when it comes to Democrats, and their also goal is to see it all blow up. They understand that if they destroy democracy as we know it, they have no system set in place for people that are closest to the pain, people who rely on social services, people who rely on public housing, people who rely on SNAP benefits. They don't have any system set up for us. And their whole goal is to get brownie points on the Internet saying that they're morally superior when in actuality they're just cynical. They are they've been enamored by. I guess the likes, the retweets, the virality that they get from TikTok or from Instagram or from Twitter or wherever, where they're constantly praised for their stances, but they stand for absolutely nothing. When you see that people are are literally in harm's way and you choose to do nothing, how does that align with your morals when you Mm -hmm. sit back and do nothing, when people are in pain and people need you? Mm -hmm. I, I just don't see what the purpose is and what they're trying to do. Because if they said that they are humanitarians and they understand the black and brown people are going to be subjected to violence due to a Trump presidency or Project 2025, how can you claim to be a humanitarian when you had the ability to actually do something by casting a simple vote to stop it? They don't understand what harm reduction is. And the reason why they continue to attack black content creators is because we're moving the needle and our message is actually resonating with people who are on the fence or thinking about sitting at home. They Mm -hmm. want something to complain about. They're already lining up their content for when shit hits the fan. You understand like when the news gets their most views is when the world is on fire. If there's a disaster, the same Mm -hmm. thing for creators. It's profitable. We already understand with the TikTok creator fund, the more views you get, the more money you get. Now, some people were getting up to like a $4,000, $2,000 check, depending on how viral the video goes. So there's that. These people who mm-hmm. quote claim to be socialists don't mind capitalizing off of TikTok when they can. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm always surprised to hear what they have going on in the background. Like I said, this latest creator who is just scrapping with all kinds of black and brown content creators online. They were basically talking about this whole idea, which I do want to end with a conversation about where we stand as con- content creators right now in the political season and how we are working with nonprofits, working with C3s and C4s. And that was a lot of what ended up being brought up by this person was like, hey, don't believe these content creators because they are in the pocket of the Democratic Party. They oh. are being paid. All of these messages you're hearing, this is all paid content. And meanwhile, 
we got Republicans being paid by the literal Russian government over here. But you have said nothing about that. You have made no statements, no commentary about it. But your goal is to target Black creators. Your goal is to bring down the Kamala Harris candidacy. And we heard even with Jill Stein, I don't know the name of this group that she has allied herself with. It's a group of, I think, mostly Arab folks in Michigan who are their specific and express purpose is stop Kamala. We want to prevent Kamala from winning Michigan. And therefore, we will be able to deny her the White House. And again, when it comes to these types of goals, if you stand for what you say you stand for, which is equality and justice for black and brown people, for LGBTQ people, for people who are underprivileged and all of this stuff, the prison industrial system, all of these things would be so much better dealt with under a a Harris Walls presidency. So I'm not really sure what their goal is. I'm not really sure what the ultimate goal is. And I feel like I've just started to say over and over again, my mantra has become a lot of people don't have a plan. They do not have a plan. And so in any area of my life, if I'm taking advice from someone, I want to know that you have done the thing that you are advising me about. Don't talk to me about what you think I ought to be doing with my life. If I can't look at your life and see, okay, that's something I want to emulate. And by the same token, with a lot of these commentators and people who have all these theories and ideas and opinions about what we ought to be doing politically, it's like, what have you built? Mm -hmm. What have you established? Everybody can tear down. Anybody can get a bat and start hammering away at the walls. But a lot of these people don't know how to build. They do not know how to build. And so I guess from your perspective, you're saying that the goal is... uh, Destruction, which I kind of tend to agree with. It's it's self-aggrandizement. I'm just like this this creator who was out here causing this trouble very recently has an agent. They mm. refer to their agent in the process of going back and forth with you and many other people. And I'm oh, like, no. how many black and brown creators are out here with agents who are I advocating for the here? Right. While you're calling yourself a communist and a socialist with an agent. But here's the thing about being a communist and a socialist. She also sells clothes at the same time. And based off of the videos that I've seen, she's blocked people who bought her product because they said that something wasn't the right size and they were either asking Mm. for a resize or asking to get a refund. She just blocked them and said, so obviously we can already tell that she's not what she claims. I find it so offensive and just insulting that for black and brown creators to come out here and advocate for issues that are going to directly impact them, that somehow that they're only doing it because they're getting paid to do it. Meaning for some odd reason, we can't advocate for ourselves without a paycheck. We can't advocate for certain issues because she said that all these people have the same talking points. We can't be educated enough to understand what's at stake. Is that what she's claiming? Like there's so much anti-blackness in this woman's statement that is just going over a lot of people's heads because they think that we're just step and fetch it or we just rinse and repeat what we hear on the internet rather than being able to intellectually come up with our own thoughts. Yeah. That that's what really pisses me off when it comes to things like that. that. But it was so triggering for me, and that's one of the reasons I've chosen to stay out of the fray, other than having a couple of side conversations on this platform on the podcast or whatever with people about it, but I've chosen to stay out of the fray on social media about it because that was the same thing I picked up with that creator earlier this year that came after me. I feel like at the foundation of their criticism of me making this video about dispelling this anti-Semitic myth, the assumption underneath all of that was, well, who are you to be talking about this? Who are you to be talking about Jewish history? Who are you to be talking about all of these issues? What investment do you have in it? And why would I ever think that somebody like you would be speaking about what, this? Other than that somebody's what hear you? that, bro? Yeah. Who else hears that all the We're time? Right. What makes you qualify? <laughs> right. Other than that somebody's just propping you up, making you a puppet, forcing you to talk about this, handing you some money. Here you go, little little Negro, dance for us. And let's put this in blackface and make you say what it is we want you to say. And it's just so deeply insulting because as we've discussed, both you and I and many other people, we were on here long before we had any kind of nonprofit organizations or political action groups reaching out to us. And yes, both Kenny and I work with some of these organizations from time to time that help us to sustain ourselves talking about stuff we were already talking about years before anybody ever came along and said, hey, can you help us get the messaging out? Yeah. 
But I would have to hold um, that third party organization a little bit accountable. Vocal needs to learn how to vet the people that they want to actually reach Absolutely. out to. Register on accounts to these third party nonprofits that are reaching out to these content creators who want to work with them. They need to vet who they want to work with because the mere fact that she said the Democratic Party was paying her when it was not. Mm -hmm. She wound up posting a screenshot of the receipts mm -hmm. of who reached out to her. It was more than just vocal. The person that wanted to reach out to her, which was the third party, was Accelerate Change. They wanted her to do something on Project 2025 because obviously we understand that with nonprofits, they're not allowed to endorse certain candidates. But any type of agenda like Project 2025 that actually might be to the detriment or share the same values as this nonprofit, they want to highlight those issues and warn people about this if it's going to affect their business. So mm -hmm. it makes sense. No, we were doing this work way before right. anybody knocked on our door. And most of these people, when they reach out to content creators and say, hey, we watched this video, there's got to be something that you've already done that led up right. to, hey, we want to partner up with you. I saw that you did a video. Most of the people who reach out to me said, I saw you did a video about reproductive rights. We would love right. to do something with you. Just <laughs> recently, break your news, you guys. I'm an animated character, you guys. So oh, wow. I've got oh, my goodness. My, they, they work with Seth MacFarlane. They're an animated group, and they wanted to animate something oh, that God. I did. For women's reproductive rights. So I had to go back and re-record a few things. And hopefully, <laughs> our God willing, I'll be able to see if they sent me the mock-up of what they wanted to do. So I saw like the 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 rough draft of it, but I just can't wait to see the final. That's so result. cool. And those are the kinds of opportunities. It's like I, I just don't understand someone who would do the kind of destructive thing that this creator did coming out and, and saying, well, you need to watch this because this is all paid messaging and whatever. I'm like, I've been watching people like you for years. Just put in the work, the sweat equity. I remember you saying a couple of years ago, I wish somebody was checking for me. I wish these organizations were because I'm sitting up here struggling to pay my bills and still here I am yeah. trying to put correct information out there. Like I have watched you and so many other people and I in the background have done what I have done for absolutely nothing. Nobody was knocking on my door. Nobody was calling on me. When here we are putting in the time, putting in the work, and then we have somebody like this basically turning a target on us and having, you know, someone with almost 2 million followers turning a target on people like you and other black and brown creators and saying, you know, you have to be suspicious of any of the messaging that they're putting out there because they're probably being paid which I think is just, is, is vile, like I said, especially considering we have had a scandal to break very recently about conservative commentators who were literally being paid by the Russian government that people like this have had nothing to say about. Nearly 400000 so, a month. $400,000 a month. Are you kidding me? And yeah, didn't so that's where the money was coming from? I mean, but Jesus, if you saw how much they're offering us, you would be disgusted because the 400,000 <laughs> versus what we're getting. Lord. <laughs> but hey, I welcome any small little checks because like Lizzo said, it's about damn time because yeah, it's about time. With I'm like, it's one of the few times I think in my online experience, the only time I've seen really a significant number of black and brown creators that I know are at least able to make what would be just a basic, maybe they're able to pay their rent. Wonderful for a few months. And we know after the political season is over, these kinds of opportunities are not going to be there in the way that they are during the height of an election. We know that. So I don't know. I sit back and I hear, you know, you say something about a possible opportunity to be involved in animation. I'm like, that's the coolest thing. Like, I'm cheering for that. I'm celebrating that because in my estimation, you deserve it. Many other people that I've witnessed doing this work for nothing, if there is a way for you to benefit from that, then you deserve it. And I know you're not out here talking about anything that you wouldn't be talking about otherwise. I know you, your message has always been consistent. So I'm not looking askance at you. And let me just close that topic off by saying this. Regardless if there's a check or no check, I've been checking people since I started on TikTok, <laughs> Twitter, everything, okay? And I feel it's more 
important regardless if there's a check involved or there's nothing. I feel like it's more important to put the information out there for my people so they have access to it. If there's something that's going to benefit my people, whether it be a policy, a program, anything, I'm going to share the information regardless if there's any monetization behind it mm -hmm. because I care more about my people than I care about money. Yeah. And I, I believe that fully because I've watched you walk that out. So I just thank you so much, Kenny, for taking time to talk to me. I know this is a busy season for a lot of us. We are just running six ways from Sunday. You're getting ready to pack up and go do an activation event, which is just so cool that you could be involved to the level that you are right now um, politically. The political world needs you. I am hoping and praying and believing that there are more opportunities for you to become more deeply involved because you are a voice that needs to be heard right now and going forward, not just election season. But going forward, I am hoping and praying and just putting my faith out there for you that the, the right opportunity is waiting for you because your mind is sharp, you are bright, and your voice is needed. So I just appreciate you taking time to talk with me today on The Breakdown and for the podcast as well. So please tell the folks where they can find you online, Kenny. This is Kenny Walden, you all, just in case I haven't said it enough. <laughs> well, you can follow me on TikTok. Twitter, Instagram, my handle is the same. It's literally the number two, raw, two real, the number two, and then raw, two, T-O-O, -O, real. Thank you so much for having me on, Dara. I really appreciate it. And for anybody who's in the Maryland MD area, we need some volunteers that are willing to do door knocking because right now a lot of the resources are being funneled to the swing states like Pennsylvania, Georgia, et cetera. Angela also broke running for U.S. Senate. She needs some help. So if you're Very in the Tacoma Park, Silver Spring area, we need as many volunteers as possible on the ground to knock on doors. Just because we're in a blue state, we're not going to take anything for granted. We need to make sure that everybody's activated and willing to go to the polls and have a plan to vote. Absolutely. Well, we're getting right here up to the wire. I've been talking about going to vote.org forward slash Dara to register to vote. I think we've probably got another maybe week or two where that is relevant. So I'm trusting that everyone's getting all of that stuff in order and is going to be ready to go. I got to send in my mail in ballot a couple of days ago. So I'm so excited to have that off my plate. And we love that. On, yeah, I can just focus on uh, helping to get the word out. I have decided to stop paying attention to polls. As I'm understanding it, I was watching a video by a, a woman named Politics Girl, and she said that a lot of right-wing polling organizations are starting they to flood the market. polls. That's what's going yes, on. They're, they're creating a lot of these junk polls that are being actually commissioned by right-wing organizations because they want to create this perception that Trump is way ahead when he's not. And as far as I'm hearing... There is record voting happening in t in Pennsylvania already, record turnout happening already in early voting in Georgia. When record turnout happens, because there are more people on, on the, the blue side, I hate talking about sides, but there are more people who are invested in Democratic policies than are in, invested in Republican policies. So when that turnout number starts to go up, that is a positive thing historically for uh, Democrats. It just is. So when you start hearing about record turnout, you already know what direction it's going in. So don't be discouraged. Do not allow these polls to discourage you. A lot of this is the false flag operation. This is not real data. So make sure you get out. Do not assume, even if you live in a blue state, do not assume that your vote does not matter. And as, as Kenny said, you can always be involved in canvassing. And you can be involved in phone banking. I just did a video recently um, with an organization with Move On. In other words, these opportunities that I had to partner with an organization to help get out the word about phone banking. There are so many things you can do, even if you live in a blue state. You can always be working and be active and be helping to, as I say, push the boulder up the hill. So thank you, Kenny Walden, for agreeing to be here and to talk to me today. Thank you all so much for listening to the breakdown here on KJLH. I'm looking forward to uh, speaking with you all next week and talking about the issues that matter. You all take care of each other. Remember to register to vote. And I will see you at the same place, same time next week. Until then, let's learn to shout. <laughs>